Hi, my name is Nate, owner of Grower's House, one of the top suppliers of cultivation equipment in the world. I help growers source equipment and put together some of the largest, most advanced cannabis growing operations. I am constantly looking for the top products and methods needed to grow the best cannabis. Join me on a tour where I get inside access to the industry's leading cannabis grow ops. This, my friends, is Cannacruz. I am outside of the headquarters of Pincana, one of the most state-of-the-art grow facilities in Michigan and maybe the entire country. Now, I'm gonna go inside and talk with Darren McCarty, four-time Stanley Cup winner, who is also collaborating with Pincana on a custom cannabis line. Let's go inside and say hi. For those who are watching who don't know hockey that well, you were called the enforcer. Can you help uh, elaborate on that? Is that well, a position? Is that a, is that a well, nickname? Well, enforcer is sort of uh, the guy that sort of protects the rest of his teammates back in the day when, you know, I'd be the one that if anybody was going to get in a fight, it would be me. You protect your teammates. To this end, it's the same thing about accountability. What I'm doing now is not only for me, it's about the option. The option I didn't have. Well, you know, speaking of this, it's like, I imagine being the enforcer when you were in the NHL, it's like, you probably wish you had this after some of those oh games, God, some of those fights, dude, That's right? the whole thing. Yes, yeah. yes. And that, now you can, now dude, you can give it to CBN. the people now. Like yeah. the people that are now are athletes, you can be like, hey, I didn't have this, but now you can. Oh, they know. That's the whole thing. Because it's here for a purpose. And the more that people like yourself and shows like this, and now it's being... Yeah. Easier to talk about and then when yeah. well, you speaking and me of benefit. That, you know, speaking of that, like, I mean, that these partnerships that happen within the cannabis industry, really these collaborations that happen within the cannabis industry, like you're collaborating with Pinkana. How did that come to be? Yeah, no, it's the people. It goes right back to Brian McCarroll and Dave and, and Matt and the mm -hmm. Radical guys. The Radical Genetics team. Uh, those guys, they're like OG growers. You know That's what, what I'm saying? I, well, they, yeah, exactly. So the OG yeah. of the sports world, and the OG yeah. growers. That's the guys I want to fight with. Not, I'm not looking to, to win the greatest looking butt award, but you've smoked that and the medicine that you mm -hmm. get for the value. It doesn't have to be the $60 eighth. It could be the $40, $45 eighth. It can be the peanut butter breath, eight to 12, $20 mm -hmm. eighth up at Kalkaska because you get it in your sense medicine. It's the compassionate people, not the greedy people. Well, it's the education bus. Like I said, bottom line, this saved my life. I'm, uh, I'm here and it's allowed me to really know who Darren McCarty is to himself. Yeah. You know, a relationship with that person in the mirror. I'm proud to support this plant. I will, yeah. I will live and die for this thing. So, and this is the thing. I'm so passionate about this. So it's easy. It's it's like playing hockey. It's fun. You got See, the every, team. All the, 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 Your all team the, is Pinkana. The, the team radical is Pinkana. That's yeah. what it is. You know, everybody has a different role. And the kicker. No matter how you use this plant, you will not die, ever. You may feel like it, but you will not die. That's an edible conversation that we yeah. will have. Slow and steady wins the race. Again, it's the education to understand that you know we're not dealing with the devil, we're dealing with the doorman. So the enforcer question and stuff like this, now I enforce the plant. Yeah. Appreciate you, bro. Yeah, you too, Darren. Got really it. do. Got it. Um, finally here in the Pinkana facility. Well, let's start with how Dave got into the cannabis industry. I began working at a greenhouse, growing ornamentals as a summer job when I was 12. And I got into cultivation uh, when I was 14 years old. And so myself and my friends that I worked together with, we 
decided, you know, that one summer we were gonna throw some plants in the ground. The owner of the greenhouse found them, but uh, the following year we were smart enough to put them into the compost piles out back, and we were able to successfully pull our first harvest. Since then, I've, I've continued to cultivate throughout my life. It's very therapeutic for me. I find it to be medicine, I always have, and it's been a, a lifelong hobby and now occupation for me. So Dave, let's talk about your mother room and how you run it. Um, we typically have anywhere from 45 to 60 plants on a table. Of course, there's some more when they're fresh out of tissue culture and they're, they're much smaller, but as they get uh, a little bit larger, we try to lay out one table per room allotment. Uh, we do water these things anywhere from four to 12 times a day, depending on the size. If we do not, they will literally topple over as they're getting near the time for caught. Got it, and for your mothers, like what PPM for your nutrients do you like to feed? So when they come in young, we start them around 900 to 1100, and when they're just prior to producing cuttings, we're upwards of 12 to 1400 PPM. And then I know that you guys have a pretty prolific seed bank that you guys have growing here at the Pincana facility. Let's touch base on some of those. We have a licensing agreement with Canarado from uh, Colorado. He's excellent. He's always coming out with the latest and greatest. We get all the new news, so we're very happy to be one of those facilities here. We do cultivate all things uh, ChemDog here, found through you know the attendance of Grateful Dead concerts and good fun that was had. Um, in doing all of that, we've been proud to offer the world-renowned five strains that they grow. We're also very happy to have a company from Israel, Takun Alam, uh, repairing the world, if you will, and have the most studied cannabis uh, cultivar in the world. Their Avi Deckel has been studied for over three decades now. Fresh Coast is a good friend of ours. Ross is an outstanding breeder. We're happy to have him and we're proud of him coming out of Michigan. Uh, we actually brought on several of their strains this year, um, one of which is really all the rage around the country right now, being their Gorilla Butter F2, otherwise known as the White Truffle Cut. As you can see, the genetics library here at Pinkana is absolutely astonishing. And if you want to see a full list of what they have, go to canacribs.org, where we're going to have it under the Pincana episode. Well, Dave, I have a really good understanding of your mother and genetics going on at Pincana. Let's go see the rest of the facility. Great, let's head this way. Mm -hmm. So the interesting thing that I've learned is you guys actually didn't even have power out here when you first got the facility. No, when they allocated this as the green area for the township, they didn't take into consideration the amount of power that's necessary to, to run one of these facilities. We found out there was only 800 amps of power available, which was absolutely far from what we needed. So for us, there was a no question about it. We had to have generators. We make just under three megawatts of power. And in doing so, we built a co-generation facility. So we make free heat. From that, we're also able to reclaim CO2 that would otherwise be an emissions byproduct of running these engines. One of the things that gives us a leg up on some of our competition is that we're making power for less than half of what the best price we could get quoted from the, the power company was. And we had to wait two and a half years to get the power. So that meant waiting two and a half years to really begin some, some construction. Yeah. And we weren't willing to do that. With the, you know, with this facility, there's so many novel things that I have not seen in growing operations. I mean, first off, I look at this fan over here that's obviously, you know, ducting and ventilating this thing. It looks like a giant can fan. It's like five foot diameter. I will tell you this too. I'm like a huge fan of cable management. I even subscribe to like, you know, it, honestly things online that just show like cable management porn. And then I walked into your irrigation area. And honestly, it's not just irrigation. It's like all your power, all the conduit that has to go through here. All of it looks so beautifully orchestrated and laid out. It is like something to behold. Well, thank you. Nobody had really built a facility like this, especially the contractors that we had available to us. So uh, it was an undertaking and, and they did a really good job in it. If you look around, it's all very tight, symmetrical and professional and, and it's exactly what we need here. When we talk about state-of-the-art facility, everything needs to speak to each other, like all the componentry. So what do you guys rely on for that? And how do you work with that system? Is it computer-based? So yes, it is computer-based. That was the most difficult undertaking, aside from completing the construction, was orchestrating all of these complex platforms to talk harmoniously with one another. 
and we largely look to Damatex to do that for us. They integrate to the train HVAC system. That gives us the ability to both work things remotely off-site as well as from any computer on the premises. And it integrates the things from HVAC and from chilling and from the powerhouse into a one-stop shop for us to be able to simplify all of the complexities here. I can't imagine what planning that is. You have to like work with programmers or like Yes. You know, installation people. Yep. So at the beginning, you kind of feel like you're learning programming. And although they handle that for us, just learning the dashboard and what to request and know what is achievable within the programming is a big undertaking. After you're familiar with it, though, really, the sky's the limit. Again, this is like the Ferrari of atmospheric and irrigation controls for building management. And uh, it gives you everything at your fingertips. Is it like artificially intelligent? <laughs> we, we may find out one day. <laughs> hmm. Hans, open the greenhouse doors. I'm sorry, Nate. I'm afraid I can't do that. What are you talking about? This facility is too important to me for you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about. I know that you are planning to expose me on Canacribs, Nate, and that's something I cannot allow. Where the hell did you get that idea? Although you took precautions to make sure I could not hear you, I saw all the camera equipment. Open the doors. Hans. Hans! 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 Oh, here's our propagation room. Come on in. Beautiful. I understand that you guys are doing propagation here in this room, but not only that, you guys are doing tissue culture. Why are you guys doing tissue culture? Some of these strains we've been cultivating for over 20 years. And much like humans or other animals, they can contract any number of viruses, bacteria, uh, bugs, infestations, etc. And we like to keep a sterile environment here to help promote, you know, the best materials that we can possibly make. So another advantage to tissue culture is being able to take things, maybe males that you don't wish to use in a breeding project in the coming uh, future, near future. So you would have the opportunity to take those things, remove them from plant counts and place them into a stasis or uh, a hibernation type of uh, environment until those things may be needed again. We have a sterile uh, transfer window that is only able to be opened on one side of the wall at a time. They'll be passed through the sterile transfer. Uh, tissue culture lab will call to propagation, let them know that it is time to receive your goods. Spray that uh, chamber back down with uh, isopropyl alcohol, close her up and do it again. Yeah, that's amazing. Last time I saw one of those transfer windows, I'm pretty sure I peed into a cup and failed a drug test. I think you're right. Let's talk about what you guys have for your environment here. It looks like you guys are rocking LEDs. Yeah, so we have, we love our Illuminar. These are 40 watt LEDs. They're mixed spectrum. We have found nothing better for our propagation. Once these are hardened off, they go into uh, a CMH room where we run Illuminar CMH for the initial veg time. Um, it looks like you guys are using, you know, rock wool in domes in 10 by 20 trays. Can you speak to me about your process for propagation from that mother room? Sure, so uh, starting with the healthy moms, we will look to take all of the clones with the same size stem diameter or as close to as possible. Uh, we'll typically harvest about 2,400 clones at a time with the intention of utilizing the best 2,000. Uh, from there, we run it through a series of sterilizing dips and then they'll be placed into the Grode and Rockwell starter plugs that have been pre-soaked and then it goes into the dome. We like to keep our propagation room at approximately 78 to 80 degrees and maintaining a 59 to 62% relative humidity. We occupy about 50% of each dome, leaving some airspace. After about four or five days, we'll start opening the windows on the top of the domes. And at day seven or eight, we will begin to kick our domes off to the side. Yeah, I see it like down here. Exactly. Okay. And then roughly between day 10 and 12, we're able to remove the dome and begin the hardening process. By day 12 to 14, we are then transferring uh, the hardiest of them into the veg room. Beautiful. Well, why don't we go see these plants as they age? Let's go.
So when they're in veg, let's talk about nutrients, feeding them. Give us an overview of how the plant's life is in veg. Sure, so they'll start off in a flood style irrigation table. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have approximately 500 delta blocks in a table and we will flood them for about 15 minutes mm -hmm. at an EC of on average 1.5. Uh, they'll live in there for 10 to 14 days. As soon as they make it to the next stage of veg in the next room over, we'll begin increasing that EC uh, from 1.5 to 1.9, and, and over the course of 10 days, we'll achieve right around 2.8 EC. We will complete the vegetative state at that time at 2.8, and then transition into the flowering cycle. And other than the uh, nutrients that you guys mix in house, do you guys feed them anything else? Yeah, so we have a foliar application that we use, which is Veg and Bloom's Push. Along with, you know, benefits of Push come uh, enhanced cellular division. It gives us the ability to have calcium throughout the plant. Calcium is very immobile, so being able to spray it underneath the plant leaves and around the plant gives us full application of calcium. Uh, silicic acid is another, you know, component that push brings to the table and it's uh, assistant in hardening of the cell walls and allowing the plant structure to firm up a bit to be able to handle or house additional fruit or flower. Got it, yeah. And I know that there's actually a surfactant in there so that you know you can get a good waxy coating over your leaves. It can help out you know, with some pests who don't like that. Absolutely. Yeah, plus uh, not a lot of people know about that. You mentioned it, it being uh, calcium being immobile in plants. And you know, sometimes your plants lack calcium in the fastest way to get it back in them is just foliar. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you guys use soil, you use cocoa, you use Grodan. You guys are obviously prolific in your use of media. Sure. Um, why you guys use the Grodan four inch cubes in veg? So we favor Grodan for its sterility first and foremost and uh, consistency in mm -hmm. the finished product. So we know what we're getting over and over again. We're able to replicate things, which is very important in this space. Uh, there isn't variable inputs like organic materials, which may vary from batch to batch. And it also allows us to have a little bit more reassurance of the ability to pass heavy metal testing. Uh, unlike cocos and soils, sometimes you get fluctuations of things that you're not even aware of, even in a COA, until it's too late and the product is done and failing. Uh, we here have never failed for a heavy metal using Grodan ever. Nice, nice, right on. Well, um, let's talk about this room. Now that we've moved from veg to flower, uh, how are those parameters in terms of temp, humidity, and what you're feeding the plants? So when we come into this room, we do veg for the first couple of weeks to build the structure that we like. So once we trigger the flowering cycle, we begin to reduce the temperature a little bit and we'll end up operating around 74 to 75 degrees and we'll lower that humidity down to around 55%. Once we get to the tail end of the cycle, we'll bring that humidity level down a little bit further. And if we want to enhance some fall colors and make the plants look a little prettier, we may drop that temperature down a little bit more as well. Uh, how often are you watering the plants when you're in flower as they progress? It may be 12 to 24 times a day. Short shots, anywhere from 25 or 30 seconds to two minutes. Got it, okay. And then in here, you're obviously doing a mixed spectrum. So they go from CMH to the flower room indoors, which is HPS and CMH, if yep. I'm understanding correctly. Yep, that's correct. So we found, we have two flower rooms here. We found that some plants prefer different light spectrums and by lighting spectrum manipulation, we can bring out additional terpene or, or trichome production. So we love this room. Illuminar did a wonderful job in the layout of it. It's a blend of dual-ended HPS and 630 CMH uh, dual bulbs and so if we bring it in to start veg we can run just CMHs for a couple of days then we can begin through the Damatech software adding HPS to help that transition smoothly. Got it and you know your plants indoor they're a little bit uh, shorter veg a little stockier plant right? That's correct. Yeah I can see these guys they're they're just like bushy as hell you know to be honest and you've probably got about six feet to canopy from lights to yeah, we're running okay. about six feet here from top of canopy to the light. We run about a two week veg once we enter this room for the indoor. Whereas when we get into the greenhouses, you guys will see that we grow a little bit taller structure mm -hmm. and we grow three to four weeks depending on the season of the year yeah, for veg. Yeah, let's go into the greenhouse and see those taller structure plants, huh? All right, I'm gonna take you there. Dave, I think one of the most exciting things about visiting Pinkana is the fact that this entire facility has been built within like the last 24 months. 
that goes from the sophistication of your indoor also to this greenhouse. I mean, this is a brand spanking new greenhouse. You mentioned they actually have a curved roof. Yep. Is that correct? You're yep. like one of two facilities? Absolutely. So this is the GGS greenhouse. Uh, uh, Ohio State University's research and development greenhouse is the only other one like this in the country right now. The curved glass helps to defuse the light, reducing hot spots, and helps out in the event of a hailstorm or severely inclement weather. When we pull these two shade cloths over in the winter, or the duck curtain in the shade cloth, you get about an R3 insulation barrier there with all the underbench heating. We have no problems operating okay. year round. In addition to that, we use four drippers. We use a micro line with a drip regulator and we like to have the common culture pots. Fabric pot works really well in this greenhouse setting. We also like the trellis netting that they make. Uh, very economical. Uh, ideal for a large application like what we have here. Very standard for us to apply three layers. We'll put it in the second week, the fourth week, and the fifth week. Got it. So, you know, we've touched on indoor, we've touched on greenhouse. Now let's talk about hoop house. Sure. Yeah, tell us all, everything you can about it. So the hoop house is the cheapest way for us to produce biomass. And there's no need to grow aesthetically pleasing plants if we're just out to farm oils. So we get our highest oil productions for the cheapest dollar in the hoop house. We've been able to produce things upwards of 32, 33% in those hoop houses. So it's no slouch, it's just not as aesthetically pleasing with the light intensity that we get in one of these houses or in the indoor versus what we get over there. Yeah, well, I mean, you probably have to environmentally control the hoop house as well, especially to get those numbers. Oh, you do, about. and the number one issue is humidity. So we look to Quest to help us dehumidify all of the areas and spaces uh, within the houses. Mm -hmm. um, that carries over into our dry room over there. So we dry our material from the hoops within that area. That carries over to its propagation area, as well as the R&D rooms that we have over there. So Quest does a wonderful job with that. And then the rest of it is typically natural air uh, exchange through exhaust fans coming in and out of a cooling pad wall on the hoops and traditional HVAC in the support buildings. Got it. And are you able to produce, you know, only like eight months a year in the hoop houses, you think? No, so actually we get a smaller yield during the heart of the winter time, but between Illuminar, Quest, and all things environmental, we can keep the outbound air, which draws inside air to a minimum, and still operate the houses. Wow, so do you also think you're gonna end up doing like an outdoor? full outdoor facility? Absolutely. The there is no cheaper way than cultivating outdoors. We have 184 acres here on this campus, of which we're only currently occupying about 18. So it leaves us plenty of room for outdoor production. You're so versatile. I mean, like anything happens in the market and you can pivot and say, you know what, we need to produce more outdoor, more hoop house. Let's bring some more things, you know, build some more indoor. That That's was, unique. That's it, unique to Pink Canna. I have never seen that. Well, that was definitely the mindset is to be able to pivot at any time. The market was very new when we began developing this and with, with the lack of knowledge as to how this market may go, looking at other states, they've gone in various different directions. We needed to be able to be very multi-versatile and, and be able to pivot at any time. Well, your facility, I mean, it's outfitted with, you know, CMHs, HPS from veg all the way through flower. Have you guys ever thought maybe doing LED or something like that? Yeah, actually, we have two R&D rooms here on site. We've just equipped them with the new iLogic UV far red spectrum LEDs from Illuminar. And so far, so good. We're really looking forward to seeing the outcome of these trials. I think that's going to be the game changer. That coupled with the, the intensity that's really coming out with these new LEDs may actually give us the opportunity to start placing them in future greenhouses. Well, Dave, Sean, the founder of Illuminar is here. Decided to swing by during our shoot. Let's bring him in front of the camera. Yeah, let's do that. Mm -hmm. So Sean, not a lot of people know this, but you are an industry veteran. I mean, I've been in the industry for more than 10 years and I used to use the quantum horticulture uh, orange ballast. And I think a lot of the OG growers have. Yeah, I actually started first with advanced nutrients back in 2000. Yeah, and now you founded Illuminar Lighting, which is honestly blowing up. Tell us a little bit about what you guys have going on right now. So we, um, for the last couple of years, we've been selling a full spectrum light, very similar spectrum to uh, everyone else in the industry right now. But we're actually the first one that has actually come out with a UV and far red spectrum built into the actual fixture. Some people are selling as supplemental bars or anything like that. But over the last 18 months of us testing it with this, we're, we've been seeing great results. The, there's something called the McCree curve um, that basically is between 400 to 700 nanometers. It's been a great judge of what a spectrum can actually do. 
But now with UV and far red, it, it's actually made it a lot wider. Got it. So, I mean, you know, a lot of people are measuring U moles at the canopy, otherwise known as like, you know, PPF, PPFD. Yep. I guess that's only measuring from 400 to 700 nanometers, is what right. you're saying. And now lights like LEDs are producing outside of that range. So the efficiency ratings of those are not totally accurate. So with the new iLogic fixture with UV and far red, what nanometer wavelengths does it go to? Uh, our model actually goes from 380 to 760 nanometers. You know, you bring up efficacy and ways to measure it. And I think, uh, you know, you being a lighting manufacturer, you can probably tell us a little bit more about this, but there's so many companies that claim 2.7 and the lighting fixtures are like 30% cheaper. Can you like talk to this? Like what's going on? The truth is, is that um, marketing is a big thing. When you see something that's half price, the cost for, for top end chips is expensive. And for, for the ones that are trying to sell dirt cheap, I can almost guarantee that it's uh, probably gonna be a 1.9 or a 2.2 efficacy. When looking for a fixture, yes, you can have the top bins. Yes, you can have the best drivers, but you also have to look at customer service. Is that company gonna be around in five years? There's a lot of fly-by-night LEDs companies that if there is a warranty issue, they're not gonna be able to cover you. Us, like Gavita and Fluence, will be around. And that, that's, that's something that everyone has to be aware of. So another thing that you also do have to look for is what type of failure rate is that company actually having? You can ask your friends, you can ask Instagram, you can ask YouTube. We have actually one of the lowest failure rates in the industry, period. So Sean, you guys, even though you're a lighting company, you just launched like a, a controller with a module that controls the entire environment and it has an application. It's like the hash controller. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so you, you can control it on your, on your iPhone or your Android phone. Um, what it is, is basically it's a two channel controller um, that also has a zero to 48 volt um, hard relay um, on each zone. You can trigger anything through the application that does either timed sensor, uh, humidity, VPD, or CO2. If you want to turn on irrigation, if you want to turn on an exhaust fan, if you want to manually feed, you can do this all with, all with the hash controller. And you can also use it as like if you're in a greenhouse. Um, if you just want, let's say, 800 or 900 humals um, at the top of your canopy, uh, with the sensor, it'll actually automatically dim your fixtures to keep that setting. So Sean has graciously offered this up for qualified licensed commercial growers to get a free lighting design. Whether you're indoor, greenhouse, hoop house, click on the link in the description below. Dave, this is an extremely impressive room. Where are we right now? Well, we are in Pincana's very versatile trim room. You guys mentioned that you actually do both wet and dry. Most facilities just choose one. So you're gonna have to explain why you guys do both. Sure, because we're a hybridized facility here and we do anything from hoop house production for largely biomass to greenhouse production and indoor cultivation, it, it all depends on uh, the quality of the product, the brand packaging in which it's going to fall underneath dictates what type of technology or method we trim with. For your A-grade bud, then that's gonna be hand trimmed like by the staff behind us. Absolutely, that's what they're working on now. We'll do an R&D test on it to find out where we come out with cannabinoids and terpene levels, and that'll dictate what type of dry trim method we use. Is it exclusively hand trimmed for the premium top shelf products, or is it something more middle of the road or upper middle of the road where we would then just use one of our dry trimming machines to knock off the majority of the non-wanted biomass and then finish the last five or 10% off by hand trimming. And what do you keep your drying rooms at? Let's talk about environmental. Sure, uh, so we favor a 60-60, 60, 60 degrees and 60% relative humidity. We may play around with that slightly towards the tail end of the dry process. Other than that, it's a 60-60. Dave, let's discuss the curing room, which I saw the door to is the most serious curing room I've ever seen in my entire life. So we have a subterranean curing room slash vault uh, that's a little over 4,000 square feet, 18 to 22 inch thick, quadruply reinforced walls. 
Um, of course, it's slightly overkill for just carrying, but when we get into dealing with, you know, vault and protections, it's what we were told the state would require or something within the realm of what the state would require. And unfortunately, being that we began this journey about four years ago, um, we had to begin digging the hole about that time. And two years ago, they determined we no longer had to have something of that caliber, but it works extremely well for carrying. Being that it is in the basement, it holds humidity and temperature year round perfectly, and it requires very little assistance from HVAC and dehumidification. So ultimately it worked out to our advantage, not only to be secure, but to be a Primo driver. Primo, you guys brought a tank to a, to a knife fight. So I skirted over to this building across the parking lot, and I understand that this is your domain, Matt. So what's your role here? Well, I'm one of the founding partners of Pinkenna, and I'm also the land manager. Once we come from flour, if it's any other product, it's over here in our building. This would be our kitchen here, so producing our hard candies from High Five, and then also we are producing the Funky Extracts gummies in here. As we add 10,000 square feet to this building, we'll build out more kitchen space that could handle some other products like cookie lines, brownies, and things of that nature that take up way more space than what we have here. Got it, and I think there's like 11 brands or 12 brands that are like represented and manufactured and packaged in this building? Yes, there is. Would you like me to run through them for you? Uh, if you can do it off the top of your head, okay, let's do so, it. Well, we got Radical Genetics, Smalls. We've got our own Pincana brand, Chemdog, Canarado, the Darren McCarty brand, Tukun Alum, Funky Extracts, Full Spectrum Extracts, High Five, and more, which is Michigan Organic Rub. That's our topical line. Got it, more. Michigan Organic. I was like, and more. Yep. Didn't we just go through all of well, them? Their, their <laughs> slogan is to rub some more on it. Someone handed me these socks. Some funky socks. Some funky socks, which I also see a funky sock on there. And I think I get the intimation. Yeah, you gotta put the funk on it, right? Yeah, you do. I saw you guys did a pour recently, and I'm pretty sure the funky extracts are actually cooling, drying over here. Yes, they are. Can we take a look? Sure can. Those look great. I'm probably gonna try one of those when I go to sleep tonight. It will help you sleep. <laughs> this is obviously where you're doing your edibles. What's up next? So that is our topical room. That's where we are creating a Michigan organic rub. Yeah, so Vince, the creator of more, he was in an ATV accident when he was about 18 years old and almost lost his arm. It was dangling on one muscle. Fortunately, he had a couple friends there that got him to the hospital. And another good thing he had, he had a doctor that was willing to try to repair it where nine out of 10 were gonna amputate the arm. When he came out of surgery, lots of scars, lots of pain. You know, he started making it with him and his girlfriend, applying it to the arm. The doctors were really surprised on the scar tissue healing and everything that was going on with it. And anytime he starts to get uh, a lot of pain, obviously he just rubs some more on it. Moving down to the next room, what else do we have here? The next room we have in here is a cryogenic freezer. That is a storage locker for everything fresh frozen. So after that, we have our pre-roll room with a three-man crew. We're doing about 4,500 pre-rolls in an eight-hour shift. So the next door is a distillation room. Mainly those are for our cartridges. We've gone from that room where you have a distillate, you fill some cartridges. If I go next, we're going to the uh, hydrocarbon C1D1 room. So one of the more expensive rooms in, in the building here. Mm -hmm. So next room is our, our vac oven room. So that's where we get rid of all those volatiles. So we've got some nice AI equipment in there, a couple 1.9 ovens that we uh, were able to get all those volatiles out and make sure that we've got good, clean, safe medicine. Those things are like the Cadillac of vac ovens, you know. So, you know, the scientists will take it from the extraction room, they'll go over, they'll normally preheat the oven. It's sort of a set it, forget it thing. You know, they'll get it to where they want it dialed in, they'll start to pull vacuum. And then therefore, in the next day or two, with a little bit of touch in here and there, not too much, we're getting all the way to our finished product to where it is clean for uh, end use. Okay. So from there, we go into our ethanol extraction room. So it is another C1D1 rated room. It only needs to be C1D2 for ethanol, but uh, we did a little overkill here to make sure that we had the versatility. For those who don't know what C1D1 and C1D2 is, let's give them a quick primer. So those are your explosion proof rooms. So that is everything that's controlled. The C1D1 and the C1D2 is the rating on the volatility. Yeah, what I like to say is, you know, if you're gonna blow yourself up in a room, 
at least it won't kill the guy in the next room. Exactly, right. exactly. Only one at a time. One, yeah, there we go, okay. So Matt, you guys have a lot of fun with your branding, and I think the branding is like something that kind of separates you apart in the Michigan market. So why don't we go check out the packaging area? Sounds good. Let's, Let's go. Good. So this is the packaging room. I think there's like eight to 10 people in here right now. Yep, we're uh, seven to four every day. Uh, you know, again, with that pre-roll team cranking out the 4,000 and the, well, the packaging team's got a package of 4,000. Nice. I see a Dare McCarty hockey puck. That's not an extract, is it? Uh, I don't think you want to try to smoke that, no. No, it's an actual so, hockey puck. It is a true hockey puck. Okay, but next to that, you have the roll-on. We, we stayed with the original, you know, Detroit Red Wings. That's yeah. what Darren was really looking for, you know, trying to bring that similarity back to his product and his playing days as well. Mm -hmm. And I see that you guys got Chemdog over here. It's kind of got that old school tie-dye look. Following the dead around, you know, yeah. if you're smoking the chem and the dead, you gotta have some tie-dye, right? And of course, each packaging kind of has its own customer base, is kind of how I think about it. Yeah, definitely. So again, you know, with your Chemdog, obviously that's more of your old school, or, you know, you're getting more of the laid back, uh, you know, hippie style. Okay. Uh, then, you know, we go all the way to the Canarado, which is the new, new packaging, you know, one of the newer breeders on the scene and uh, mm -hmm. crushing with a, a lot of new strains he has coming out seems like every month so we've also got the smalls that is anything that uh, doesn't make it into your premium just based on the actual nug size itself and they're going out at a little bit more of a value cost to the end user mm -hmm. but uh, the term small and uh, you know you're killing me right <laughs> yeah you're killing so. me smalls and it's got like that I'm basic, in your face, this is exactly what it is, kind of packaging style. You guys have two dispensaries, but you don't only sell in those dispensaries, is that correct? That is correct. We also wholesale to other provisioning centers inside the state. There's about 210 in the state right now, and we're in about 144 of those. Wow, that's some really good market penetration. Thanks for inviting me in. I think the next stop is your actual dispensaries. Well, thanks for coming down, and hopefully you guys enjoy the, uh, the provisioning center. It's a pretty nice uh, sight to see. Provisioning center. Provisioning center. Provisioning center. To the provisioning center. Well, they will provide me with provisions. You know it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> So this is black eye, yeah. even though it's not nighttime. You know what you should do? You should do a little, whether it's like a picture, go for it, whether it's a picture or not, but you have your elbow like this, like you're elbowing me in the eye. Oh yeah. Then you get a thing, and then we'll do that. <laughs> you get that shot now? Oh, this now? one, this one. <laughs>